We've talked about learning where you're making individual predictions, like in a classifier. We've, we've also talked about making predictions sequentially, when you have a string of inputs coming in one at a time. But what we haven't talked about is when you have an agent interacting with a world, where the decisions you make change the kinds of situations and the kinds of input that you're going to get in the future. The kind of machine learning that deals with this is reinforcement learning, and this is a subject of study worthy of its own course that's sometimes offered at the University of Maryland. But today we're just going to give a very broad overview and talk about how reinforcement learning connects with some of the other machine learning techniques that we've talked about in this course. The kinds of situations where you can use reinforcement learning are when you have an agent that's interacting with the world somehow. This could be a Roomba, a robot that's trying to figure out its way through the house to get the house clean as possible and then to find its way back to its home. It could be a factory trying to figure out what is the best way to assemble a product and get it out the door as fast and as cheap as possible. Or it could be someone playing a game where the moves that you make in a game, like in, say, backgammon, change the moves that your opponent will make. All of these tasks have a similar structure. There's some goal that you want to achieve, but it's a long way off. And when, say, you're building a product, you have to put a bunch of pieces together, and you only know how quickly you make the product when it's actually done. And so you have this effect of a delayed reward that you don't know how good you're doing until the very end of the process. There's also an element of exploration that as you go along, you make choices, and you can try out new things, and those could be great, or those actions could be horrible, but you won't know for a while because of the delayed reward. And there's also a problem that your state, where you are, what you're doing, may be unknown to you. So the Roomba doesn't have very advanced sensors as it's moving around the house. And so it may not know exactly where it is, but it needs to figure out a best guess of where it is. And from that information, take actions that will get the house clean, but also try to figure out where the heck it is in the house. One of the earliest successes of reinforcement learning was to play games. And one game in particular was backgammon. And Gary Tassaro in the mid-90s created a agent that could play backgammon. And he used reinforcement learning to learn how to do this, and it could beat uh, almost all of the best uh, backgammon players in the world just by playing itself and exploring the different configurations you can reach in a game of backgammon. We'll talk more about some of the applications and uses of reinforcement learning in a bit, but first let's define a little bit more formally what the reinforcement learning problem looks like. Reinforcement learning works over time steps, and at each time step, the agent takes some action, and we'll call that A. The agent also gets a reward for taking its action. This is saying, how good is it that you made this choice? And this could be uh, how much money you get, it could be how clean the house is, things like that. And you also get an observation. This observation could be a noisy version of your state, or it could be additional information that the world is giving you about what uh, the other players in the game are doing. Basically, any information that the agent gets as a result of taking their actions is encoded in this observation. Reinforcement learning acts as sort of an agent against the world. And so the agent is allowed to take these actions, and the world is providing this feedback of rewards and observations. Here's the setup again in a more schematic format. You have the agent, and you have the environment, the agent gets to choose its action, and the environment, the world, provides the next state and the reward, given that the agent made some choice of an action. And over time, the agent is making these choices of action, it's getting some reward, its goal is to try to maximize this reward. One formalization of the reinforcement learning problem is as a Markov decision process. And so this says that there are a finite number of states in the world. This is a limiting assumption, but it, it proves to be fairly general. And you have some set of actions A that the agent can take. When the agent makes some action, it gets a reward. And then the agent receives the new state that it's in. It's called a Markov decision process, 
because the state is assumed to only depend on the current state and the action that the agent takes. And the same is also true of the reward. But the agent may not know the exact state that it's in, and these transitions from state to state could be non-deterministic. They just don't depend on a long history of previous states. As we said before, the goal of the agent is to maximize its reward over time. And so the way that it's going to try to do that is to have a policy that chooses what action it's going to take in a particular state. And the goal of this policy is to optimize its expected reward over time. But that expected reward needs to take into account future reward. And the typical way to do this is to use something called discounting. This is terminology that comes from economics. And what you do is you have some multiplicative factor that diminishes your reward in the future. And so this factor gamma is basically saying, how much more do I value immediate reward over delayed reward? So one thing that you may notice is that we're trying to map states to actions, but that isn't the feedback that we get from the environment. The feedback that we get from the environment is given a tuple of state and action, we get some reward. So the job of our algorithm is to try to figure out what actions we should be taking. Reinforcement learning algorithms need to learn both a policy, what action to take in particular states. They also need to have something called a value function that says, how good is it to take some particular action in a given state, i.e. try to estimate the reward. And they often have a model that tries to understand the environment. These policies can be either deterministic or stochastic as appropriate to the problem that you're trying to solve. And a way of trying to estimate how good it is to pursue some policy is to learn what's called a value function. And a value function takes, as an argument, some policy pi, and then says, if you're in some state s, here is what I think your reward will be with your discount factor gamma. And so this is basically saying, if you start in some state s, how good of a reward are you going to get? In reinforcement learning, what we want to do is we want to find out what the optimal policy is. But we only have the rewards for particular states. And in fact, we don't even have those for all possible states that we need to explore in order to figure out what those immediate rewards are. And we may not be able to find all of them if our state space is very large. And so as we find those immediate rewards, what we need to do is we need to estimate what is the Q function of those states. And the Q function is defined as if you are in state S and take action A, what is the best possible reward that you can get? Now, if you knew those Q values perfectly, you could then just take the arg max over all of your Q values, and then for every state, figure out if you're in this state, this is the action that you should take to optimize your reward. And this process is called Q learning. If the agent knows the transition function delta and the reward function R, it could try to estimate the values explicitly. But if it doesn't, Q learning works better. And so Q learning, more precisely, is defined as, and so Q learning allows you to find the optimal policy even if you don't know the value function. And so here are equations, what I just said a moment ago. The Q function takes the reward of executing a single action and then applies a discount to the expected reward that you get by following that action going forward. And so the nice thing is, even if this value function is stochastic and the delta is unknown, so long as you can estimate the expected value of this, you can fill in your Q function. And from that, you can estimate the best policy by taking the argmax of each of the Q functions in a given state. So obviously the Q functions and the V functions are very closely related. The V star for an optimal policy is just taking the max 
over your q functions. And so when we write it like this, we can define q recursively. So q is just your current reward from executing an action, add in the discount factor, and then take the best q of an adjacent state that you can reach with some other action. And so this is the real q, the, the optimal q that we want to learn at the end. But we can iteratively refine our estimate of q by approximating q, say starting it all out with zero, and then adding in what is the best reward that we can take given our current explorations of the states and actions that we can reach from our current state. So just to reiterate, uh, the q function gives you the expected total reward of taking action A from state S under a particular policy with a discount factor gamma. And we haven't always applied the expectation, but if there's some stochasticness to your markup decision process in that your rewards or your actions aren't deterministic, this is computed with respect to that expectation. And once you have this Q function, you can use that to figure out your policy. So with these equations, we now have an algorithm that we can use to try to learn a policy in deterministic worlds. And so initialize your estimate of the Q matrix to zero. So for every state, for every action, set that to zero. And then take some action, you get some reward. You also get a new state that you're in. And then you update the estimate of your Q function for the state that you were in, given the action that you took, based on the new state that you're in. It has some Q function. It could still be zero, but there is some value here. You look at all the possible next actions you could take, and you uh, multiply that by the discount factor and add that in to the reward that you got for the action that you took and you update your estimate for the state that you were in to have that information. And then you continue on doing the same thing for the new state that you're in. So let's see an example of this. You're currently in this state here. You move to the right, and you get a zero reward. But the Q function for this state that you now landed in has estimates of 63, 81, and 100 for the neighboring states. So uh, you take the max of those, and that is 100, and you multiply that by 0.9. Uh, you got zero reward for doing that, and 0.9 times 100 is 90. So now you update the Q function for going uh, in state 1 to the right, to be 90. If your rewards are all non-negative, then over time your Q functions will monotonically increase, but they will never be larger than the true Q function for those states. So uh, by this logic, they'll eventually converge to the true Q function and you're all set. And the nice thing about this is that it requires very little modification if uh, your system is non-deterministic. Three, two, if your system is non-deterministic, you replace the deterministic values with expected values. And so you can do this by keeping track of the number of times you visited a state and using the number of visits to uh, represent your certainty of how well you have characterized the randomness of this particular state. Let's now go back to the example that we talked about at the very beginning. One of the early successes of reinforcement learning called TV Gammon an agent that played backgammon. And the reason that it's called TD gammon is because of temporal difference learning. And so one of the innovations of this system was that it used temporal difference learning. And so we wrote these equations for the Q function just looking one time step in advance. So uh, you, you take some action, you get a reward, and then you look at the max over all of the next actions that you could take in the state, and then you use that to update your Q function. So why only look one state in the future? Why not look many states in the future? And with a little bit of math, you can show that this is an interpolation between your old value 
and your learn value. And by interpolating between these two, you get a signal that when your error is big, you should be learning more stuff here, that you should be visiting these states more frequently. And so this algorithm was uh, developed by Richard Sutton, but famously applied to backgammon by Gary Tassaro, as we mentioned earlier. And so for many years, this is the kind of reinforcement learning that was happening in machine learning. But it doesn't always work well. Uh, because many times our reinforcement learning problems are really big. We have gigantic state spaces, and it's hard to know when we learn something about state 157, what does that mean about state 246? During the 90s and early 2000s, one of the big changes that happened was using classifiers and feature-based representations of states to, to try to get a better handle on scaling to very large state spaces. And so let's, for example, say that you're playing Pac-Man. There are many, many states here, but rather than trying to enumerate all possible states and treating each one as an individual entry in this Q matrix, you can write down some feature functions that do a good job of explaining what kind of state that you're in. You could create features such as how close is the nearest ghost? You could also create uh, features such as where is the closest dot that will allow you to eat the ghost. Uh, you can also encode features such as is your agent in a tunnel? And so if your agent is in a tunnel and there are ghosts on either side of the tunnel, that is a pretty bad state to be in. And by encoding these sorts of feature functions, you can have a more robust representation of your world. And we're going to talk about next how we can represent features in a reinforcement learning algorithm, learn from the actions of an expert, and then create a system that can imitate those actions and do a good job of interacting with this world. And then we'll be able to talk about some of the very recent changes in reinforcement learning about going beyond feature-based representations and talking about how we can use deep learning algorithms to discover features that do a good job of describing our environment.